Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 113. Would you like a fast way to share your data science project results as an interactive dashboard instead of a Jupyter notebook? Streamlit is a library for creating simple web apps and dashboards using just Python. This week on the show, Christopher Trudeau is here, bringing another batch of PyCoders Weekly articles and projects. We talk about the article, Forget About Jupyter Notebooks, showcase your research using dashboards. It covers the basics of turning a data science script into an interactive dashboard using Streamlit. We also share some additional resources to get you started with the library. Christopher discusses an article covering ways to make life easier when working with Python regular expressions. He talks about composing verbose regexes using f-strings and potentially reusing these patterns. We cover several other articles and projects from the Python community, including a news roundup, a step-by-step project to build a URL shortener with FastAPI, how Python's functions are sometimes classes, an automatic water pistol pigeon deterrent project, a discussion about music playlists for coding, a project for Python metadata extraction without execution, and a powerful audio-to-MIDI converter library. This episode is brought to you by Rookout. Rookout Live Debugging debugs without restarting your app, non-breaking breakpoints, identify bugs quickly for dev, staging, and production in any environment. Try it free at rookout.com. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Christopher, welcome back. Hey there. We're back to doing a little bit of news this week and pay attention to some security stuff that's happening. And so maybe we should start with that. And then actually another incident in the Python world kind of popped up right right in the middle of uh, us discussing it. So yeah, it's a little bit disheartening. There's been news kicking around about the CTX package on PyPI. It was found to have an exploit in it. This is one of those libraries that you may not know you're using, but you might be using. It gives a dictionary the ability to be accessed like an, like an object. So you can access the keys in the dictionary through dot notation as well as through square brackets. Uh. So it's a small library, but it, it gets used by other libraries. And someone stole the credentials of the owner of CTX and then injected some malicious code. The library has since been taken down. Uh, The person doing the exploit was grabbing environment variables and sending the contents of those environment variables off to a server. Yeah, Heroku, right? Yeah, and you might sort of wonder why, why is that important? Well, a lot of hosting services, you put the keys for your website inside of environment variables so that they're not permanently inside of your code repositories. So by grabbing environment variables, they're grabbing things like AWS keys, which you, in then theory, could do other horrible things with. Yeah. I did find a report on the register.com saying that the responsible party claimed he had no malicious intent. He did it to show the potential security problems in third party libraries and hasn't done anything with the content. Uh, you sort of cross your fingers that that's true. <laughs> How white is this person's hat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so we've seen exploits like this before in other coding communities. They don't seem to pop up in Python as often, but you know, this is the reality of the, uh, of the internet. So, you know, pin your versions, boys and girls. Don't do auto updates. Configure your servers so that they can call, only call out to known addresses. The, these are the sort of typical security things you do if you're running production code. And uh, if you were doing those things, you wouldn't got caught by this. But unfortunately, a lot of us don't do that often. Yeah. And then if that wasn't fun enough, just as, as the community was sort of dealing with this, it popped out yesterday. Somebody found a bunch of typo squatting attacks and this is where a someone registers a package in PyPI, which is a genuine package that has a name that is similar to the name of an existing package. In this case, it was requests with two S's. 
And if you accidentally added two S's to the middle of requests, you'd be getting this package instead, and it had malicious content in it. Uh, once it was found, PyPI disabled not just the uh, repo, but also took down the account that registered it. And the, the account had three or, or four other typo squatters on, in it as well. So this was obviously somebody who was going down that path. Yeah, crypto mining was what was they were trying to do in that one. Yeah, it, you know, it, it, this is one of those things, right? Like, uh, the open source is really kind of built on trust, and uh, we wouldn't have got here to where we are without it. But the flip side of it is you kind of have to be paranoid at the same time. Yeah. Next week, I had a listener, James Plugger, who heard me saying, hey, I'd really like to talk more about security packages and things like that. And he's somebody who's worked in the security industry, and worked a lot with Python and has lots of suggestions for anybody interested in getting into that stuff. So it should be a fun episode covering a lot more in the security world. And then, you know, we've done a couple other previous episodes uh, about supply chain stuff. So yeah, stuff to stay on top of. I, you know, the good news of it is with it being open source and particularly the way most Python things are packaged, you, if you wish to be truly paranoid about it, you can always look into exactly what you're using. Yeah. In the closed source world, you can't do that. The flip side of it is there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of people contributing and uh, that makes it a little harder. You know, I, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I don't have time to read every line of every code of every library that I'm using. Right? <laughs> a level of vigilance that might not have. That's why he had some suggestions, different, you know, packages that can kind of scan through things and, and look at stuff. And, and we've mentioned uh, tools that do that and stay on top of it. But I guess a lot of them resource kind of known vulnerability lists and things like that. Feels very much like the <laughs> the malware world, you know, in some ways. But yeah, good to stay on top of. That kind of brings us into some articles. And my first one is a real Python one. It's by Philip Escani. It's another step by step project one. And this one is named "Build a URL Shortener with Fast API and Python." We've talked about Fast API on the show a couple times. It's a very popular library for building APIs, kind of as the name implies, very quickly. This one goes kind of in a slightly different direction with what they're doing with it. It is using SQL Alchemy in a, a role to kind of do some of the storage and retrieval and CRUD kind of stuff that you would need with a database with a Fast API. So it kind of feels a little different to me. It was really good practice for me to kind of do other things with Fast API. I enjoyed it. It was a kind of an interesting project, and I could kind of see definitely the next steps, the kinds of things that you would want to add on top of it. And it uses some other familiar tools that we've looked at before. Uh, Uvacorn is one that it uses as kind of a development web server, and it, so it's a good one to practice with that again. It uses that uh, flag where it kind of looks at as you save, it will reload everything, which is nice. And you start out just, again, step by step, going through preparing your environment, installing all the different packages, talks a little bit about the 12-factor app, which I'll include a link for, which is this sort of methodology for designing apps in a way that is considered sort of professional and sustainable. And part of that is what you were just talking about of environment and variables and things like that, those kind of credential things and knowing how to use them and store them and manage them properly. Again, I learned a lot about SQL Alchemy just kind of not only from this, but uh, an upcoming uh, course that you are working on or just completed. And we're just kind of working through how to getting it published, but it was really kind of fun to kind of see it again this one is using a SQLite database. And if you're not familiar, it's very much like a, a Bitly or other type of site that you would use where you give it a web address and it provides you a short version of that. It has a lot of kind of nice techniques where you'll go through creating the basic version of it and stand it up and get it running. And then you go through refactoring the code and why you might want to separate things out and move them into different pieces. And you create the basic root location with fast API, and then pretty quickly you're into using its really nice built-in Swagger UI, which helps you work with the API kind of directly and try things out. And then in this case, you are actually able to create entries and put them into the database and 
it's a nice step-by-step project. It gets you pretty far along into it. It's mostly the Python side of it, in my opinion. I think if you were going to present this to someone else to like have users use a tool like this, the things that you're going to really need to get into next is like, okay, well, how do I want to host this? And then how would I maybe want to make a front end for it? I enjoyed it. I think it's a really good tool here, kind of getting in and using some of these familiar tools in a slightly different way and another handy step-by-step project. Years ago, a startup I was at, we wrote one simply because we wanted a shortener that was branded under our URLs for our customers rather than under Bitly or, or one of the Google ones. Yeah. And we used Django to do it. And the internal name for it was the Duke of Earl. So <laughs> nice. There you go. <laughs> I like it. Get the needle out of your haystack and stay in production with Rookout live debugging. Rookout uses non breaking breakpoints to debug code without stopping your app, without adding code, and without restarting. Generate live logs and ship them automatically to your other monitoring tools. Quick, simple, and dynamic live debugging makes changes five times faster. Try us out at rookout.com. That's R-O-O-K-O-U-T dot com. Rookout is dynamic observability. So what's your first one? This is an article from Trey Hunter, and it's entitled Callables, Python's Functions Are Sometimes Classes. Title might be a bit confusing at first, but the essence of it is that many things you think of as a function in Python, in fact, I do this all the time, I shorten it in my head, is that's just a function. A lot of them just aren't functions. And this isn't a philosophical, everything is an object sort of argument. It's the fact that many of the function-like things are actually classes. To see this, you open up the REPL and you use, say, int, which you which is used to turn a string into an integer. But if you just put int without the parentheses, you'll see that it actually is a class. Uh, Same goes for reversed, enumerate, range, all these things that we tend to think of as functions because we use them that way. And Python kind of doubles down on it because all of them are named with small case and we tend to name our classes with big case, so capital case, so all the more reason you think of it as a function. So what's going on here? Well, Python has a way to make a class act as if it's a function, and this is known as making it callable. So this is a nice little callback to our last few podcasts where we've been talking about the magic of Dunder methods. Uh, in case you're not a regular listener, and really, why wouldn't you be? Yeah, come on. Dunder methods <laughs> are the special methods that begin with double underscores in a class, which are used to make the class behave like a Python library object. So you can use Dunder methods to get instances of your classes to compare to each other, you know, greater than, less than, that kind of stuff, or respond to like the le- length function, that kind of stuff. So in this case, the Dunder method is called double underscore call, double underscore, and any object that implements this is callable. And the method takes star args and star star keyword args. So when your object is used like a function, whatever you pass into that function like things gets passed into call. Article walks you through a whole bunch of use cases, shows you where it's commonly used in the standard library, and then sort of wraps it up by pointing out, you know, the beauty of Python is the caller doesn't really need to care, right? It's function or callable. They all quack like a duck. It, it just, you know, as a user, it just works. So it's, you know, another tool in the toolbox. It's something that you uh, can do if you haven't done it before, and the article walks you through it nicely. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, trace stuff's really good. The Python morsels. Yeah, it definitely ties into everything <laughs> we've been speaking about lately. That's nice. You need a theme, right? Yeah, I think we do. Speaking of stuff that's been mentioned a whole bunch, I have shared over the gosh, the last two years, kind of glancing looks at this particular library I'm going to talk about next. And it's based around a recent article that's by Steph Smeets that's published on Medium and published in Netherlands eScience Center. The title of it is Forget About Jupyter Notebooks. Showcase your research using dashboards. I'm a big fan of visualizations. I'm a big fan of dashboards. That was something that I actually really enjoyed building and creating and still am very interested about, like 
that part of the problem solving, which is to share what you've created with others and give them a way to kind of interact with it and play with it and see what they can. And Jupyter Notebooks are not maybe the best tool for that. Yes, you can potentially share them, but one of the biggest down <laughs> sides of that is that they're filled with code and that code can look really overwhelming to people and for them to see the results in it might require uh, some training um, not only that that they're non-linear in execution so the state of the notebook which we've mentioned before you can run cells in whatever order you like so you may not know what's happening and instructing somebody to run them properly so that's kind of a weird thing. It's a hard to share kind of thing, which I also already kind of said, if you want to share a pure Python Jupyter notebook, you're going to be doing some installation, putting some libraries together, maybe creating environments. And it also leaves it open for modifications. And there are places that host this stuff like Google Colab or Binder or some other things. But anyway, hopefully you're seeing maybe there are some downsides of potentially just like tossing a Jupyter notebook to somebody or saving it as a, a static thing, which then, again, that kind of defeats the purpose of being interactive. So dashboards, and we've talked about some other potential solutions in the past. We've mentioned a tool called Dash, one called Panel. There's a few other ones, like I've mentioned how you could kind of set up Bokeh to do some of these things. And there's one that we haven't kind of mentioned before called Voila, but the one that has come up in our episodes is Streamlit. For reference, there's a detailed comparison post by Stephen Kilcommons that's on Data Driven Insider, another Medium post. It has a comparison of those four, Dash, Panel, Voila, and Streamlit. This particular article is about Streamlit that I'm talking about also, and that's the one that's been mentioned in previous episodes. In fact, episode 15, which is like the first episode in this style for real Python podcast where we had PyCoders kind of style stuff with David. David had mentioned an article about getting machine learning to production. I'll include a link to that. And it kind of talks about getting going with using Streamlit there. And then he mentioned it again in episode 64, talking about detecting deforestation with Python, which is a another article on Medium that was going in and doing detection of deforestation with satellite images and then creating a dashboard behind it. And again, they use Streamlit. So the author here, their impression was after having played with Streamlit for a week, they found it really straightforward to get started with. And I did too. It was real easy to kind of walk through this simple tutorial in this post. It works in a very interesting way. It has a very linear execution model. It basically runs your code just straight through the list. And there isn't any need to do any kind of web development at all. It has everything kind of built in for that. And so that's probably the biggest advantage over some of the other dashboard tools where if you want it to look anything kind of nice, you end up having to kind of get into HTML and potentially JavaScript land of kind of working with this. So this doesn't have to do that, which is really nice. It's a real simple API. It's easy to manage. It's maybe in some ways simple, but again, then maybe you can fit it in your head. So there's kind of those balances there. And then a lot of people consider it one of the fastest ways to get this stuff up and running. And so that's why it keeps being mentioned. So you build in this article a real simple dashboard. It uses matplotlib in this case and adds three controllable sliders and a header. As many other tools you might have worked with, you are creating a really simple client-server situation where you run it, and then it serves it up, and then you can go to that address. So like something on an internal intranet would be an easy way to kind of host this thing. The Streamlit has a free option for their cloud version. And so in that, if you wanted to host through them, and in that case, you can put all of your code in a GitHub repo and point it to Streamlit, and it opens up and hosts it. And along with the GitHub, you know, your Python code there, you have a requirements file to kind of say any additional libraries that you're using there. I just really kind of dug it. it if you go through this tutorial that gets you started here, I would suggest you go right to their Streamlit docs. It has a create an app page. In that one, you're doing a little more complex stuff. And to me, 
it's starting to actually show what makes it special. It has these nice kind of areas where you can choose to look at the original data, which is a nice tool that's in there. Um, it shows like not only sliders and other toggle things, but like you can add switches and other types of controls. So it has a nice mix of those things in that one. A little bigger example. And so I think that would be a good next step if you're looking at it. I think there's a lot of things that kind of make it sort of special. Like it's the interactive controls are really easy to utilize. It looks nice right out of the box. It has exporting of graphics, which is really nice. Again, simple concept. If you adjust the controls, it runs your script again, top to bottom. So it just does that, all that kind of automatically. Now that might seem like, well, okay, you mean it's going to load all the data and do all this other kind of stuff that might potentially take time. There is a caching decorator that you can use to choose areas where that's needed. So like something like loading data, you can kind of do that. In the end, it was very easy for me to get my script up and running on it. So I think any data science quick script or other thing that you want and turn into a dashboard would be pretty quick. It supports matplotlib, Altair, Bokeh, Plotly, Seaborn, GraphViz, all these common graphing, graphical libraries and so forth. And again, you can host it yourself or Streamlit Cloud. So yeah, I was impressed with it. It was nice to finally, after hearing about it for the last couple of years, to get a chance to kind of play with it a little bit and build my own little dashboard with it. If you're looking to add that stuff into your data science library and share your work, this is a nice tool. Yeah, the sharing part's always important, right? Like, you know, the, the, the reason you build a dashboard in the first place is so that other people can see content and react to the content, right? H having yeah. all the data is no good unless you can visualize it and show it. So yeah, and then interact with it is really that next level. Yeah, because yeah. that and, and, and removing the need for them to have to have Python installed or whatever. So your so your C yeah. suite, you just give them the URL and say, "Go look at this. This is why you. This is why yeah. we're losing sales." Rather than go install fifteen things before I tell you why we're losing sales. Yeah. <laughs> Let me show you how we're going to save money. <laughs> yes, it's important. And here are you, here are your controls for that. <laughs> what do you got next? Yep. Uh, so this one's called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of F-Strings and RE.Verbose. And it's by the almost anonymous Adrian. Uh, Adrian doesn't give much more info about himself on his site besides that. Okay. Although uh, kudos to the URL, which is death.ngravity.com. I'm impressed. So Nice. The article is about one of my most favoritist re things, which uh, in regular expressions, which is re.verbose. This is a flag you can use with a regex that makes them more readable. When you use the flag, white space and new lines become ignored inside the regex, which means you can take all that horrible letter soup of a regex and split it up into multiple lines and then put comments on each line. Yeah. So I find that this is a go-to for me. As soon as I discovered this in Python, I was like, oh, I'm never going back. This is fantastic. And I, I'd come across this idea before. I think I mentioned it in the course I had, which was a few years back that it makes a big difference when you're writing a regex. The neat trick that Adrian talks about on top of this is to combine this with f-strings. So oftentimes inside of a regex, you'll have regexes inside of your regex because, you know, it's not complicated enough on its own. So <laughs> l let's use email as an example. So email addresses are far more complicated than most people realize. In fact, most websites are horribly restrictive when they ask for an email address and stop you from using perfectly valid addresses. I'm looking at you every site that doesn't allow me to use a plus sign and to note who's spamming me, right? So that there's all sorts of things here that the, your standard JavaScript thing just goes, oh, is it a name and an at and a host and a dot? Great, we'll let it through and it ignores the rest of the spec. The full email address spec is actually capable of handling angle brackets to indicate information such as display name. So if you've got like a Gmail account, you can go in and compose a message to somebody, click on the bubble that's their to address, copy that and paste it somewhere else, and you'll get something like first name, last name, angle brackets, then the email part. So if you were ambitious enough to try and create a regex for all this, you might have a sub regex for just the address part, and then a bigger one that included the full spec. So with me? Yeah. This is where the f-string thing comes in. So okay. you take the inner regex and put that in a variable. And then you take the outer regex and just use the variable inclusion of the f-string. And combined with the re.verbose, this means you end up having almost this self-commenting piece, right? So 
you could build the regex that had first name, comment, this is the first name, chunk that is last name, comment, this is the chunk that is the last name, brace bracket, address. And what's inside of that is the variable that you used before that declared the address regex. So this allows you to basically build building blocks of regexes instead of copying and pasting. Huh. You're reusing. And it's just sort of, it's a way of composing things, which uh, I thought was kind of clever and is something I'm going to be adding to my toolkit. Yeah. Yeah. He gives examples for like, like, like the phone number kind of break apart and yep. a couple other ones. But yeah, common yeah, one. I, I could see how the email would be even more complex, plus what you're talking about. Well, and, and phone numbers, I always try to avoid them when I'm teaching the regex stuff because that's a very North American biased thing. How we form, how we format them, we assume that's how everybody formats them and it's not. So, but yeah. Yeah, true. Interesting. Okay, cool. And by the next one, which is just sort of a quick little quirky one, uh, this is by Max, I think it's Nagy. Uh, and it details how he wrote some Python to shoot pigeons with a water pistol. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> he was tired of cleaning up pigeon poop on his balcony. He goes into long details about all the ways of trying to scare pigeons away and why none of them work. So he took an old iPhone, some Python, the OpenCV library to ev- identify what a pigeon looks like, <laughs> and hooked it up to a uh, water pistol yeah. with a little uh, solenoid on the trigger. And he walks you through what he did, how to build it all, complete with some sample code, Spoiler alert, the rats with wings are still winning, uh, but it is a cool yeah. project. Pigeons suck, man. They're so hard to get rid of. <laughs> Complete tangent. Do you know how why we have them all over our cities in North America? They're, they're not native to North America. They were originally brought over for food. And at one point, it was trendy for rich people to breed them. And then this fell out of fashion. And because it was no longer trendy, they all just sort of got released into the wild. So as food scraps become commonplace in the bigger cities, their population exploded. So now, thanks to pigeons, we have statues of cute little cherubs with evil metal spikes stuck to their heads. Yeah, uh, I've, he- I've heard this story is possibly apocryphal, and I'm probably going to get angry letters from the Audubon Society, but uh, rich people, huh? <laughs> yeah, people have time to look for birds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had a pigeon problem when I lived in Arizona. Um, they loved the area around my chimney and they occasionally would uh, stumble down the chimney. (laughs) And so you'd hear like this crazy scratching inside your house, like with very horror, horror movie kind of sound effects. And then you're like, Oh, I know what that is. And so you'd have to like (laughs) prepare to like, open the flue and grab a soot covered pigeon and hopefully not release it in your house (laughs) to cover your house with soot. It was uh, probably, I don't know, three or four times between my parents' house and then my own house in Arizona. I don't know. Not, not a, you wouldn't think they would love Arizona so much, but I guess they're the climate too. They're everywhere. (laughs) That, yeah. yeah. If they can survive in Toronto winters, Arizona is probably a beach vacation. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another RealPython video course. It covers a topic we've touched on several times over the past couple of episodes, how Python internally constructs objects, and how to customize the process. It's titled Using Python Class Constructors. It's based on a RealPython tutorial by Leodonis Pozo Ramos, and in the course, Darren Jones takes you through how to understand Python's internal instantiation process how to customize object initialization using Dunder init, and how to fine-tune object creation by overriding Dunder new. If you want to dive deeper into the internal process of class constructors, this video course is for you. You'll be able to tweak the creation and initialization of objects in your own custom Python classes, which gives you control over the instantiation process at a more advanced level. Like most video courses on RealPython, The course is broken into easily consumable sections. You get code examples for the techniques shown, and all courses have a transcript including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the search tool on realpython.com. All right, well, that takes us to a discussion, and we thought we'd make stuff a, a little lighter this week, which I'm kind of excited about. And in my very early episodes, I 
asked a weekly question, which was, what kind of music do you listen to when you program? And I kept getting a really common answer of nothing, (laughs) silence, I can't have music. And uh, I think that's still uh, kind of a common thing. Uh, A lot of people that code, that's the best way for them to think. I am not one of those people. I, when I got into coding, my, my favorite thing to do was I had a old black iPod, maybe that, I don't know what generation that is, maybe fifth generation. I bought these big headphones, which I'm using for podcasting now. And it was a really obvious sign to other people that were in this sort of somewhat you know, semi open office, you know, with sort of cubes and stuff like that, that, oh, he's working. <laughs> right. And so I think a lot of people still use that in, in those environments. I don't wear headphones at home as much unless I'm doing some audio work specifically. But you had shared this on PyCoders, a post or tweet by Patrick Lober. Do you have a favorite playlist for coding? And playlist is kind of interesting one. I think there are ones that are like that, right? That you basically are choosing a specific layout of music. The ones I can think of as uh, lo-fi hip-hop is a really popular one that I've seen, like, like you'll see like a 10 hour thing on YouTube with that, where it's like no vocals, just this kind of lo-fi hip hop thing. I used to think of it as chill hop, but the lo-fi, I guess you had like record scratches and stuff. <laughs> so you can kind of hear it in there, the the sound of vinyl. But there's an interesting list of people answering there. Quite a few people, you can see where they're from because there was lots of uh, Indian music, Hindi or Tamil, a variety of things there. And then... Uh, a lot of people like to listen to soundtracks. A handful of these were true like playlists, and so they were sharing like YouTube videos and things like that that are in there. For me, I've always had to kind of create my own playlist, <laughs> and so I I do like some soundtracks. My favorite is I'm a huge Peter Gabriel fan. He's probably my favorite artist you know out there. But he created a soundtrack called Passion. It's the music for The Last Temptation of Christ, which is not not The Passion of the Christ, not that movie. It's, it's a different one. The soundtrack you'll know right away. It's a great instrumental soundtrack. And that really got me into other Peter Gabriel stuff that he had a real world label that he was working with quite a bit. And I like that kind of like world music, a mix of stuff that's sort of soundtrack stuff. And then when I got into the sequel job that I had, I started to listen to a bunch of EDM stuff. And I found this artist, Brian... And so it goes by BT and kind of similarly, he's done a bunch of film and, and video game stuff. I guess one of the funnier things that he did uh, recently is a uh, Tomorrowland, the areas of Tomorrowland and Shanghai Disney. He created this like four hour loop of music to kind of create the atmosphere for Tomorrowland. So I'm interested about that, but he has a really great double album called these hopeful machines, which I can just go to forever. And a couple other artists that are like that, Zed, Z-E-D-D, and um, earlier chain smoker stuff. I really like their stuff. And one of the funniest ones is this guy um, that's a little more lyrical stuff. That That's kind of the one thing that throws me off is if I'm familiar with the music, I can probably listen to it, like some, some Nine Inch Nails or some other kinds of like harder kinds of music. If I'm super familiar with it, I can kind of listen to it. Um, definitely their instrumental stuff I can. But then there's a few artists, like uh, there's an artist called Fantagram and Purity Ring, and then a band, well, an artist, he calls himself Big Data, which I think is an awesome name. <laughs> and uh, But it's kind of like more, I don't know, pop, EDM kind of stuff. I don't know. I, I just dig it a lot. It's really kind of cool music. So that, I kind of listen to those things. I don't usually, I've kind of created my own playlist. I am was a subscriber to Spotify for a while. I'm not currently... It's pretty good about finding stuff that's like it. If you just kind of let it keep playing, it'll keep finding stuff that's in a similar vein. Apple Music is really behind on that. They're trying to catch up. It's getting a little better lately. But the way I originally did it was Pandora. I would just feed a bunch of like three or four of these artists into their algorithm. And what popped out was always a a nice kind of thing that I could kind of just keep playing when I got into the streaming era finally. But initially it was just I had a bunch of these albums and just loaded them up on my my iPod, because <laughs> that was uh, the thing I was doing back in 2011, 2012. So do you listen to music when you code? I do. Uh, I do. I need it to shut the rest of the world out. 
I'm very particular about uh, it can't have any uh, even even familiar lyrics in it. Okay. I have very language-oriented synapses. If I hear even little bits of it, my brain goes to that and I lose track of what I'm concentrating on. Hmm. But I do have a, a fairly wide variety. A lot of it just sort of depends. I've never bothered with the streaming thing myself, so it's usually you know my own lists with VLC running in the background. Okay. And I went, just because we were talking about it, I, I I went through and sort of dug around and I've got, you know, I've got one, I've got one named piano that's mostly Chopin. I've got instrumental classical, which is a mix of stuff. I've got oh, cool. a bunch of soundtracks. So the, um, the Lord of the Ring ones uh, have a fairly decent sort of backgroundy kind of classical pieces. I've, I've got that mixed in somewhere. And then I've got things that are a little more upbeat and have some beat. And that ranges from music that I wouldn't listen to personally, except when I'm coding. And most of that's my wife's taste. I listen to her, I hear her stuff and then I go, oh, there's no lyrics in that. And it's, it's, it's got a beat. I'll put it, I couldn't tell you who half the artists are. Yeah. And there's some old soundtracks that have snuck into that as well. I've noticed there seems to be a lot of stuff from like the Mat- first Matrix soundtrack. So you're, you're, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I dug those ones. Portishead and uh, Chemical Brothers, that kind of stuff, right? So, you know... Yeah, real late 90s. Yeah, cool stuff. A little late 90s sort of dancey-ish club sound stuff. And uh, and, and some of it is so much so only in my coding that if I happen to hear it outside of my coding, it's a weird experience. It's it's like... uh, (laughs) Where am I? (laughs) So somebody thinks I should be working. I don't understand. So I do find it interesting sort of going through the list of folks. Like you said, there's, there's a, it's all over the shop, but uh, you know, there's things in here that there's, there's music listed in here that I love, but I couldn't imagine coding to it, right? Uh, somebody says... Mean in the post? Yeah, in the post, right? So, like, you know, somebody... Oh, a queen! And I'm thinking, that's all anthem yeah. songs. I, I, I'd, be singing, I'd be singing <laughs> along. I wouldn't get anything done. Somebody, I'm not sure whether or not he's trolling, but he said he uses Eye of the Tiger on a one-hour repeat, which yeah, I'm... I think that's a joke. <laughs> I'm hoping. I'm really, really hoping that's because, wow. Because, honestly, that's distracting me just thinking thinking about yeah. it so <laughs> but i guess it's a personal taste thing uh, more than anything else yeah yeah definitely that was what was so funny about it i just was so surprised that so many people were like yeah just silence it's like my one chance to kind of turn off things i think it depends on the area where i'm coding you know if that makes sense like kind of there's different like if i'm writing then i definitely can't have lyrics right (laughs) if i'm writing words um like doing more of that kind of thing but if i'm kind of like solving problems then it kind of can kind of blend so it kind of depends on on that and then now i kind of have uh i kind of have some mindless like work time now i don't know it's mindless but there's like things i have to do you know task kind of driven stuff that isn't so much coding and that's definitely when i kick in the music yeah well, I, I find, you know, you, you talk about writing. When I code, I am writing because I'm usually, when I'm it, even when I'm in problem-solving mode, it's like, okay, here's three lines of comments that talks about what I'm about yeah, to write okay. in the algorithm because that's just how I process it, right? So Yeah, yeah. So yeah, can't, can't have the language stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, confusing. And, and I find particularly, I, you know, I'm working from home now, so it doesn't matter as much, but uh, when I was in that cube-style office space, even just having the headphones on wasn't enough to block out the noise around me. So you've got to have something going to do it. And and I noticed a couple of things that were in the uh, Twitter thread were things like white noise generators and, you know, jungle sounds and things like that, right? It's something that isn't, but it's enough to sort of feed your ears something besides, in my case, I distinctly remember the guy on the other side of my cube selling hard drives at the top of his lungs on speakerphone continually, right? So, uh, oh yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> all depends on your office mates. So, wow. <laughs> yeah, there's a few in here that I thought that are kind of cool, like uh, like a acoustic guitar playlist would be kind of good. But yeah, there's a few different arts that I've kind of liked in that vein. But somebody mentioned I go with podcasts. I'm like, oh, no. Yeah, yeah, I, I saw I, one. I could which, never do that. <laughs> I, I saw one which was like comedy, and I'm like, oh my god, no! Like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How could <Yeah>. you possibly? <laughs> yeah. But, my wife d- can like have a like a TV program running beside her and be working, and I'm like, yeah, I don't know how you do. Yeah. So <laughs> that's definitely not mine. 
Yeah, cool. Well, it'd be interesting to hear, you know, kind of keep uh, pay attention to some of these other ones. And again, some of them are actual playlists. So there, there's a couple kind of interesting things in there. So we'll share that and see what people think. So uh, that takes us into projects this week. I guess I'll go first. Actually, maybe you should go first because mine's long. <laughs> mine's a journey. <laughs> Fair enough. So I came across this project called Dowsing. Ran into it when I was digging into another project, which is called Import Tracker. So Import Tracker helps you track your third-party dependencies. Dowsing is a metadata parser that gives you info about a Python project. The thing that I thought was kind of clever about it is it uses Python's abstract syntax tree. And that means it's parsing. Okay. So why am I all excited about a parser? Uh, well, who doesn't get excited about parsers? But uh, <laughs> right. uh, so a lot of Python packages are configured around setup.py, which is itself an executable script, which means if you want to get some of that data out of it, what ends up happening is you need the environment to run it in order to get the information about what environment you need to run it. There's a bit of a catch-22. And particularly if you're trying to look into a package that, say, might be older and you don't have your environment set up in that range or certain packages, this can be problematic. So Dowsing, on the other hand, parses the files instead, reads them the same way the Python compiler does, looks at the AST that is generated from that and turns that into data and then prints out that meta information. So it works with setup.py as well as project TOML files. And this is a bit of a niche thing, but if you need to programmatically introspect a package, this is far better than just, okay, I'll run whatever. And when I think to you know the conversation we started with here about security and things, why would you want to run some other someone else's code to find out what it needs when you could actually just you know parse it and figure it out, right? So yeah, so it's a it's a small thing, but a useful little tool for for the right uh, use case. I could see how this could fit into that security discussion that I'm going to have next week. Uh, yes, um, <laughs> yeah, that'd be nice to use. Yeah, cool. That's a nice tool. Great. So my <laughs> my project this week kind of became a, a bit of a journey and that's partly i don't know i want to say it's entirely my fault but it's partly my fault uh, in the sense that i bought a new computer and so my previous computer i had had for several years and so i had several versions of python on it and so when i'd run into trouble with installing certain things i would just kind of roll back okay well we'll just go to 3.8 and that's fine and we'll work with it but I'm reluctant to install Python 3.8 on, you know, this brand new machine I have. I'm like, I already got Python 3.9 and 3.10 on it, and I'm looking forward to 3.11 soon. <laughs> haven't done the alpha yet. I'm, I'm still looking at it. So I'm like, really do I got to go back in time? So let me just talk about what it is. So Spotify has been doing a bunch of really interesting projects. They've open-sourced a lot of things that they do. They have... They call it the Spotify's Audio Intelligence Lab. And one of the other projects I had heard about actually at PyCon is something called Pedalboard. And that one's an interesting one where it's kind of like an audio processing. It's not real time, but it's something where you have a Python library where you can kind of apply effects to different sound files and, and so forth. And it kind of leads into a little bit of the stuff I was talking about in episode 96 with Braden Riggs. Where we mentioned this tool, Labrosa, we mentioned a whole bunch of other kind of things of kind of playing with audio and manipulating it. And I'm kind of coming from it as a music audio engineer experimenter kind of person. And it definitely has a lot of those things. That's what Pedalboard has. But this new one popped up in my timeline, not from the usual Python people in my timeline, but from the music technology kind of people that I follow. And it's really, really early. It's one of those that has a 0.0.1 <laughs> version number, but it's called Basic Pitch. And it's a Python library for automatic music transcription. The idea behind it is not necessarily to transcribe it into sheet music or what have you, but to turn it into MIDI. I've talked about MIDI a few times on the show, but it's this musical instrument digital interface that's been around since the 80s that is a really nice protocol for having keyboards communicate with computers and you know producing music and so forth so it can take not monophonic individual note like you know saxophone or a trumpet or something like that but actual polyphonic music like a guitar or piano or the whole band playing and it will turn that music into a midi file 
for you, which is pretty neat. And it's, I think, why they released it just now. It came out here in May and here on the top of June. They had a publication of a paper at, let me get this right, the (laughs) (laughs) ICASSP, which is the International Conference on Acoustic Speech and Signal Processing. And so the 2022 IEEE conference on this thing just happened and they released a paper and the paper was titled a lightweight instrument agnostic model for polyphonic note transcription and multi-pitch estimation (laughs) i tried to get this thing installed because i got so excited yesterday and i kind of went down a real deep rabbit hole and i think the thing that was defeating me was pytorch and pytorch is one of the libraries used for some of the modeling that's in it and I don't think PyTorch is fully baked for M1 Max yet. And so I kind of had some trouble and I was having to roll back. Okay, it's not working 310, it's not working 39. Okay, well, I guess I, I guess it needs 38 based on what I'm reading here and looking at things. And that ended up being a real kind of hassle because it's not a super easy install from python.org. You have to do a build and didn't follow those instructions completely because I should have read ahead in the instructions. And uh, anyway, so I was just, it was kind of a pain in the butt. But I, I'm going to watch this thing. It's definitely new. And there's a really nice demo at this website of basicpitch.io where you can play with it. And you can just toss an audio file into it. And it has a variety of sliders kind of talking about streamlit st- style where you could kind of adjust sensitivity, note length, should it divide things up, do all these kind of things that you would think as far as controls to decide how these kind of parameters that you want it to work in. And then it it can export that MIDI file for you directly. So I have this acoustic guitar recording that I just had done. And I just recorded, I built a project two weekends ago where it's a contact microphone. It's a project that you can kind of stick on your guitar and then plug into an XLR input and then it uses phantom voltage to power it and really nice sounding little thing. Anyway, so I had that recording kind of ready to go Threw it into this thing. And I was like, wow, this is actually working pretty well. So I'm impressed with this super early alpha version of this thing. Uh, It's open source. They do request if people play with it, that they, if they're going to use it in other academic research, make sure that you cite it. I'll include the GitHub link to it. And then if you want to just play with it, if you're interested in the whole music MIDI and programming kind of route. Um, I think it's really kind of neat. There are some interesting caveats. It it definitely wants a f- you know a smaller file size if possible. It folds everything to mono kind of automatically and it down samples to twenty two kilohertz, which isn't super great. But you know at least for what it's doing, you can kind of pay attention to those parameters as you kind of go in. Um, but I just found it as kind of a neat project. And I think Spotify is doing some really fun stuff with this group they have, the Audio Intelligence Lab. And so if you look at their just the GitHub repository for Spotify itself, you can see a couple of the other projects they're working on. And so, yeah, kind of combines a bunch of stuff I'm interested in. And I'll get it running soon. <laughs> so the the ch- the challenge with this kind of thing is once you're a certain ways down the path uh, you yeah. can't stop so. <laughs> yeah i i kind of data science is kind of in a weird state you know like i always feel like it's just slightly behind in the versions it's using and it would prefer that you just keep going on intel and and the way things were cuz there's a lot of work <laughs> and you know i understand that but i also I'm here in the mainline area looking at the newest features of you know Python coming out too. So I, I don't know. I, I, I wonder sometimes like uh, you would almost have to do a survey to say, okay, well, what are all these people that are doing data science currently? You know, what is their build? Like what is the, the current build that everybody's kind of working off of? So, but interesting. Cool. I guess that takes us to the end this week. Thanks for bringing all those great articles and resources this week again. Always a pleasure. All right. Well, I'll talk to you soon. Cheers. And don't forget that Rookout live debugging debugs without restarting your app. Non-breaking breakpoints. Identify bugs quickly in Python, Ruby, .NET, Node, Golang, and Java. Try it free at rookout.com. 
I want to thank Christopher Trudeau for coming on the show this week. And I want to thank you for listening to The Real Python Podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that The Real Python Podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.